he promised that his department was, quote, committed to walking the path of reform with our community. Krauss never bothered to explain exactly what his cops had done wrong. They were cops. That was enough. That same day, the Fort Worth School Board issued a statement declaring that, quote, police practices are deeply rooted in white supremacy. Once again, no one specified which police practices reflected white supremacy or what that accusation even meant. It was a blanket condemnation, but it was left to hang in the air. As usual, no one in authority pushed back against it in a Republican-led city. It'll be interesting to know what happens to the murder rate in Fort Worth over the next year. We can guess. We're seeing it all over the country. We've seen it many times through the years. When the people in charge undermine the law, violence surges. But there is a solution to this vortex, and it's called leadership. 65 years ago, politicians throughout the American South refused to submit to the Supreme Court's Brown versus Board decision. Authorities in many states simply ignored the law like it didn't exist. Armed extremist groups filled the vacuum. They used violence to make their own laws. Ultimately, the federal government stepped in and restored order. In 1957, President Dwight Eisenhower federalized the National Guard of Arkansas. He sent troops to Little Rock to force Governor Orville Faubus to obey the law. So the question is, where is our Justice Department today, right now? Is there a reason the DOJ hasn't filed federal conspiracy charges against the people who organized and led these riots? It's not as if we don't know who they are. Their crimes are on YouTube. You know the reason. Black Lives Matter was involved. It is politically sensitive. No prosecutor wants to be called a racist, as if it's racist to punish people for crimes they committed. You wonder what the victims of those crimes think. The old people who were beaten to the ground for trying to defend their property. The shop owners whose life savings were stolen or burned. The families of the people who were murdered during the riots, and there were quite a few of them. No one is defending these people. No one is punishing their attackers. Nobody cares. Imagine how they feel about that. What recourse do they have? Do they have to torch a Wendy's or loot a Walmart to get our attention? Let's hope not. It might be enough to have a single national leader, just one, who understands what is actually going on in this country and is brave enough to say so. That might make all the difference, and it would certainly make the political career of the person who does it. In the fall of 1968, a teaching assistant at San Francisco State University called George Murray gave a speech endorsing racial violence. Murray urged black students to bring guns to campus and, quote, kill all the slave masters. Murray, by the way, was the, quote, minister of education in the local Black Panther Party, which was the Antifa of its time. When administrators learned about Murray's speech, they equivocated, but ultimately they suspended him under pressure. In response to this, a group called the Third World Liberation Front shut down the campus. Sound familiar? They demanded the university drop all admission standards for black applicants and admit students purely on the basis of race. Administrators were paralyzed in the face of this more than anything they didn't want to be called racist. The university's president was so terrorized by it that he quit and left. Ultimately, the leadership of San Francisco State fell to an unlikely president, a Japanese-Canadian academic called S.I. Hayakawa. Hayakawa was short, eccentric, wore thick glasses, but he was completely fearless. On December 2nd, 1968, Hayakawa marched into the middle of a student protest. Rioters immediately assaulted him, but Hayakawa kept going. He climbed onto the roof of a sound truck and ripped the wires out of the loudspeaker. San Francisco State University reopened that day. So here's the lesson for today's office holders. S.I. Hayakawa became a folk hero for standing up to the mob. He was elected to the United States Senate from California. Republicans supported him. Voters did too. They didn't always understand him. Hayakawa wore a Scottish tam o' shanter cap in public and never really explained why he did. But it didn't matter. He was brave and honest, and voters appreciated that above all. They always do. We don't have our Hayakawa yet. Instead, we have cowards. Our leaders are happy to talk about everything but the collapse of the centuries-old civilization tumbling down around them. They have no idea how little credibility they have. They have no sense of how irrelevant they have become. If you can't tell the truth when the truth actually matters, then nothing you say matters. Meanwhile, Black Lives Matter becomes more powerful and more popular with the public. Why is that happening exactly? Here's why. Because Black Lives Matter is getting exactly what they want. And that is the most basic sign of strength. Strength is the most appealing quality to voters and to people and to animals. Three weeks ago, Black Lives Matter demanded that cities defund their police. 
Today, the mighty NYPD, the biggest police department in our nation, the most sophisticated police department in the world, bowed and announced it is abolishing its entire plainclothes division. 600 people gone for good because Black Lives Matter wanted it done. And now it is done. That's not bluffing. It's not posturing. It's not tweeting. That is real power. You'll notice it did not require the usual maneuvering for Black Lives Matter to get that power. They didn't need a team of lawyers to get it. Black Lives Matter doesn't make legal arguments. They're not trying to convince you of anything. Black Lives Matter believes in force. They flood the streets with angry young people who break things, and they hurt anyone who gets in the way. When they want something, they take it. Make them mad, and they will set your business on fire. Annoy them, and they will occupy your downtown and declare a brand new country. You're not going to do anything about it. They know that for certain. This is the most destructive kind of politics. We've seen a lot of it in recent years. Organized groups did it to Brett Kavanaugh. The main point of slandering Kavanaugh was never to block his confirmation. We misread that. They knew they probably couldn't achieve it. The real point was to send Kavanaugh and John Roberts and the other Republican justices a very clear message. Step out of line and we will hurt your families. And judging from recent court decisions, it worked. At times, it's very clear that supposedly conservative justices are afraid to defy the mob. So what message do the rest of us take from what's happened over the past three weeks? It's very simple. The message is force is more effective than voting. Elections change nothing. Rioting, by contrast, makes you rich and powerful. When you riot, prosecutors will ignore the law on your behalf. Corporations will send you millions. Politicians will kneel down before you. It works. Violence works. That's the message. Everyone hears that message. Until violence stops working, violence will continue.